Good morning, my name is Grace Ressler and I'm a family law attorney at Myrick O'Connell in Boston. And I'm glad to be helping out the Veterans Legal Services today um, in creating this instructional video as to how to file a divorce and how to fill out some of the forms. So the first thing that you're gonna need is your original marriage certificate. The court will not proceed without it. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you grab that from uh, the town hall where you were married, or you can also grab it online uh, at the Massachusetts Registry of Vital Records. Um, and you wanna make sure that it is an original. You'll have a, a stamped seal on it that is raised. Um, the court will not accept a copy, so you wanna make sure that you've got that stamp that's there. Um, if you were married in another country or the marriage certificate is in a foreign um, language, you'll wanna make sure that you get it translated and the translation will be attached um, to the original marriage certificate. Um, now for our purposes, you could probably have the translation um, done uh, informally, but a formal translation likely will be required by the court later on. Um, so just kind of think about that when you are preparing to file. The next step is compl um, completing the divorce forms, and there are several. Um, one of them is the complaint for divorce, which is very important. And so I actually printed out the complaint just so you can see. Um, on the top here is going to have your information, your street address, and your spouse's information there. Um, and it's going to ask where you were married, um, and what town you were married in, and the date of that marriage. It will also ask when the last time that you resided together. If you're still living together, then it's absolutely okay to write in still living together. That's perfectly fine. The next section is about whether there are minor or dependent children. In Massachusetts, if there's anyone in your household that's a child of yours, an adopted child of yours, who's under age 23, you can certainly put in their names and dates of birth in that section, section three. The next section certifies that no previous action or divorce um, has happened uh, or is pending right now. So in most cases, this will be the first time that you um, have filed. Um, but if it's not, and if there's something else that's been pending, you have to write that down so you give the court notice. Um, number five says, on or about on a blank date, the defendant or the marriage um, suffered an irretrievable breakdown. And, you know, sometimes it's okay to put today's date if this is the day that you think, you know, we're serious about this, I'm serious about this process. But if you were separated already, for example, some people put in the date that they physically separated, <clears throat> that you left the home. And that's fine. And the last box is really the most important, which is your request for relief. And so you can see there that there's um, a box for granted divorce for. Um, the most typical reason why someone gets a divorce is just simply an irretrievable breakdown um, that you, know, you no longer want to be married. Um, if there are allegations of physical or sexual abuse, you certainly can put in um, cruel and abusive treatment as one of the reasons for the divorce. Um, the next section talks about whether you want um, custody of children. You certainly can click off that box, um, and that might be primary physical. It might be 50-50, um, but you can certainly write in that information in the complaint, because if you don't ask for it in the complaint, then you can't potentially get it from the court. Um, the next one is called, it's the prohibit defendant from imposing any restraint on plaintiff's personal liberty. This is not a restraining order per se, but it is a heads up that means, you know, if both of us are living in the same house together, we should respect each other's privacy. We should be respectful of each other. We want to click that box. Um, the next section is whether or not you're asking for some kind of child support or alimony, depending upon the situation. Um, certainly if they're minor children, you wanna make sure that the child support box is checked. Um, and then there's another section for order conveyance of the real estate located at. And sometimes if you do have a home, if you wanna put that information about the home um, in there, that's fine. Otherwise, I always do a kind of a catch-all that says an equitable division of the marital estate 
state, which would include division of your vehicles, any kind of home, any kind of checking accounts, bank accounts, et cetera. It's somewhat about a catch-all, but you can write that in there. And then the last one is um, if you want to resume a former name or your, um, your maiden name, you can also click that in here too. Um, the thing is, you also have an opportunity at the end of the divorce to ask for that relief as well. So if you don't do it right away in the complaint, it's okay. That's the complaint for divorce. That's the first one. The next one is called the R408 statistical form, which is very simple. Um, it has just a lot of basic information, sharing the social securities uh, numbers of the parties, um, the names, the number of marriage that this is. Sometimes this could be maybe your first or second marriage. The, um, the Bureau of Statistics wants to know that. Um, so it's very, very simple, straightforward form. The next one is an affidavit of care and custody, which again notifies the court that there are minor children involved in the case and um, you have to sign this one on the bottom there's a signature line um, for that form but you identify the minor children you identify where they live the current address um, of the children your address um, <clears throat> and uh, and the next one is a child support guidelines worksheet which if you are going to be asking for child support, you might want to file that with the court in advance. That is, uh, you can simply Google the child support guidelines. I think we have the link in the, um, in the paperwork here, um, but we'll be able to, to ask for support. Um, and last is the military affidavit, which certifies that either um, you or your spouse are currently in the military um, or have had military service, and you also sign that one. You know, my best advice is if you need any assistance with filling out the forms, the registry um, is available to assist you. Um, they have now the virtual registry by Zoom, um, so you can speak to someone um, and not leave your home. Uh, which is great. And um, the other thing is too, a lot of the courts are doing lawyer for the day services virtually. So you can also contact the court to try to find uh, a lawyer for the day program that's available and you can make an appointment with the lawyer for the day, which is also great. Um, so when it comes time to file the documents, you're going to take all five of those, the uh, marriage certificate, actually six, the marriage certificate, the complaint for divorce, the R408 statistical form, the affidavit of care and custody, the child support guidelines, and the military affidavit. You're going to file those all together um, with the court. Now, you can mail them in. You can um, deliver them in person. And the fee is, the total fee is $220. Um, and if you earn about 1300 a month or less gross income, you are eligible <clears throat> to potentially get that fee waived. And not only would you potentially get that fee waived, but you also would be eligible to get the service of the summons fee waived when you have to go to the constable. So one of the things you can do is fill out an affidavit of indigency with the court. Um, they'll have it there. You can also get it online uh, to certify what you earn. Um, if you were on Mass Health or you received Chapter 115 benefits, more than likely you will be able to, um, to fill out that affidavit of indigency and get those fees waived. Um, if you don't meet that criteria, but paying the fees would still be a significant hardship for you, um, you can also fill out, um, you can still fill out the affidavit of indigency and try to identify, you know, why it is that you need this fee waiver, what would be the negative impact on you. Um, and like I said, you'll want to include both the fee for filing divorce, which is about 204 Two five, um, two twenty. Excuse me, um, and also the fee for service of the complaint because that's going to be the constable cost that you want waived as well. Um, so speaking of the constable, um, in Massachusetts, um, every sheriff's office has a civil process division, and those are the constables. And so you will want to serve or have all the paperwork served on your spouse. Um, so two things: one. You want to make copies for yourself of everything that you have filed. Um, 
you know, including even the copy of the marriage certificate. You will start your own, you're going to be your own lawyer, you're going to start your own file, um, and you're going to keep that paperwork. So every time you file something with the court, make sure you keep a copy for yourself. Um, and so when you go to the sheriff's office, you're going to give them the originals, um, which they are gonna serve on your spouse. And the reason for that is because your spouse needs to be officially notified that there's a lawsuit now pending against him or her. And the best way to do that is by constable. Um, the only other option that you have is if your spouse would agree to accept that service and sign those papers in front of a notary with you there. Um, so if your spouse is willing to do that, that's great. Um, but if not, then you want to use the constable. The constable will often ask you, you know, what type of car does the person drive? Where do they work? What's their schedule? What's their cell phone number? Um, because they want to try to work with the person in order to, to serve them um, and have it be, um, you know, not a nice experience, but have it be an appropriate experience for the person as well. Um, when you, when the constable serves your spouse, the constable will then certify that they served your spouse and send all of that um, back to you. You will be responsible for filing that certificate of service with the court. And, um, and if you don't, then the court will not give you any court dates. The court will not acknowledge that your case is in existence because right now, in the eyes of the court, nothing has happened. The other person does not know. So it is very, very important for you to make sure that number one, your spouse gets served with all the appropriate paperwork, and also that the constable sends you back the certificate of service and you file that with the court to prove to the court that both parties now know there's a divorce. Um, when, you, uh, when you file, that certificate of service that says my spouse now knows that there's a divorce filed, you'll want to ask for a court date. Um, and generally, it could be called a case management conference, it could be a status conference, but you want to make sure that the court gives you some date in the future so that your case moves along um, smoothly. Now, sometimes you might need immediate assistance. Maybe um, Maybe you want your spouse to move out of the home, but they're not doing that. Maybe it's not safe in the home. Um, maybe you need support. Maybe you've already been separated, um, but, but you've got the kids in the house and your spouse um, is living outside of the house. In those instances, you want to actually try to do what's called a motion for temporary orders. It's the opportunity for the court to weigh in on temporary issues like child support, where the, where's everyone living, where are the children going to school, that kind of thing. And you file that motion for temporary orders after you've been given a docket number because you're going to make sure that your docket number, the same number that you get from the, sur the summons, is on those motions. So the court will use your same number every time um, to, for, for everything in the case. Um, when, you, um, when you file the motion for temporary orders, you will get back a receipt from the court and a hearing date. When you have the hearing date, you are gonna have to, again, make sure you make copies of everything. You're gonna have to copy the, um, the court notice and the motion and you're going to have to send it by mail to the other side so that they know they have they're on notice that they have a hearing on such and such a date and unfortunately if you don't do that and if you show up at that hearing but your spouse does not nothing will happen because the court will say well did you send notice of the hearing to the other side and if you say no then they can't allow you to have a hearing. So you always wanna make sure that you are keeping the other side in the loop on any motions or hearings that are assigned to your case. Um, just side note on the motions. Sometimes the courts are having Zoom hearings. Sometimes the courts are now having in-person hearings. You wanna dress nicely for both. Um, think about going to church, think about going to um, a family function or a party. Um, you know, having, 
you know, no, no bare sleeves, that's a no-no, um, but you wanna dress nice, you're showing um, respect for the court and the process, and the judges appreciate that very much. And in some cases, I've seen judges, you know, tell individuals, if, if you don't go and put on a jacket, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna let you in. And so we wanna make sure that everyone is dressed appropriately so that you can go and have your hearing. Um, if you do have children, Massachusetts mandates that you take an online parenting education class. You do not have to take it with your spouse. It is a completely independent process. Um, they run, um, they run, I think, every couple of weeks, and they are all over. Physically, they're all over. But like I said, online, um, you can just sign up and, and take the class. Um, it is mandatory to take this class. And without taking it, the judge will not give you a pretrial conference hearing, um, which is really important. So you want to make sure that if there are children, that both you and your spouse take that class. When you complete the class, you will receive a certificate of completion, and you'll actually have to file that certificate of completion with the court. And so you want to make sure, as proof, again, that you've taken the class. So you want to make sure that you take the class, that you get the certificate within a reasonable period of finishing, and lastly, that you file that certificate. Um, let's see what else. The last piece of filing a divorce is the financial disclosures, and there's really kind of two parts to that. The first is called Rule 410, which is an exchange of all of your checking account information, all of your retirement account information, your most recent pay stubs, if applicable, three years of tax returns, any um, loans or mortgage mortgages that you've applied for in the last three years, both parties are going to gather all of that information up um, individually and then exchange the information, right? And the reason why we do that is because you want to make sure that you understand what's been going on in the other person's financial picture and they want to understand what's going on in yours, okay? So that's rule 410. The other side is um, the other side is the financial statement. And I'm going to take you through the financial statement briefly. There are two forms for a financial statement. Um, the short form is for anyone that's earning under $75,000 um, gross. And so here's what the front page of the short form financial statement looks like. Um, it can be a little intimidating, but we're gonna walk through it, okay? Um, and, if you, and if you earn more than $75,000, then you'll, then you'll do the long form. Um, what do we use the short form for, or any form? Um, this is to disclose your income, your assets, your liabilities. It is going to be critical for a judge to see both people's financial statements if you go to court. It's also critical for you to see the other person's financial statement in order to make any kind of settlement decisions um, going forward because you want to make sure that you understand the full financial picture um, of what your marriage looks like. And everything is considered to be in the marital estate um, unless a judge says otherwise. So um, on the top, I'm gonna take, I'll just take you through this. So on the top part, you're gonna write your name as the plaintiff and your spouse's name as the defendant. And you can see there's a whole bunch of information specifically about you. And that includes your name, address, telephone number, your date of birth, one thing about social security number, don't put in the full social security number. We don't want those, we don't want all the full social roaming around the courts. Um, just put in the last four digits, that's fine. Um, your occupation, uh, the, the judge wants to know what you do for a living, who your employer is, where do you work, and the employer's information, and the employer's telephone number. Now, if you're not employed, you can simply say unemployed. If you're part-time, you can say part-time chef, you know, that's fine. Um, and then health insurance. The judge always wants to know who has the health insurance. If you are on Mass Health, you can say Mass Health. Um, if you have private insurance, you can put that down. You can say Blue Cross Blue Shield or Harvard Pilgrim. Um, if your spouse is the person that carries that insurance for you, I always put in parentheses, you know, through husband or through wife or something to that effect. So the judge knows. Um, on the next section is the gross weekly income, okay? And what you're gonna look at here um, is, again, the gross, and it's weekly, so be careful. So a lot of people get paid 
um, biweekly. So you're going to take that number in two. So everything on this statement is a weekly number. So if you have a monthly bill, you're going to want to make sure that you multiply the month by 12, divide it by 52. That'll give you the best number to use. Um, same thing, if you have bi-weekly pay stubs, you're going to cut that number in half. That'll be your weekly amount that you'd put on here. So there's a couple of options for weekly. One is base pay from salary or wages, right? So if you earn a salary, you're going to figure out what the weekly amount of that salary is. Um, if you have wages, um, you know, whatever your weekly wage is. If you work overtime, you want to be able to put that down. Most pay stubs will um, identify specifically overtime income. Um, part-time job. It's important for the judge to know if you have a full-time job plus a part-time job or if you're just working part-time, you're going to be able to put that there. Self-employment, if you own your own business, um, you're definitely going to want to identify that to the judge and we'll be able to work that out on the, on the other page. Um, any tips, if you're a hairdresser, um, if you're an Uber driver and you get tips, you'll want to identify those for the judge. And then if you have investments or a pension, um, let's say if you were a police officer and you're getting a pension, you're going to want to make sure you identify that as well because that is a source of income. Um, if you're on Social Security, you'll want to know, you'll want to be able to note how much Social Security per week you receive. And again, it's not net, it's the gross amount. So you're going to take what the government pays you totally on this page, and the second page we're going to talk about any deductions that the government takes out or any deductions that your employer takes out. Um, public assistance. So again, if you're on SNAP benefits, um, if you have welfare, you're going to write that down. That's considered income. Um, any kind of rental income from anything you own, if you rent out a property, you're going to put that in there too. Um, most of the time you can use a tax return to find that information. It's most, it's easier that way. Contributions from household members. Let's say that, you know, maybe your mom lives with you and she gives you $200 a week to help with the groceries. You want to put that down and you can explain what it is. Okay. So that's from the first page. Second page, here are the deductions, right? So from a paycheck, you'll be able to see um, whether you have a, when you have federal money, you know, money taken out for taxes, federal taxes, state taxes, FICA, which is Social Security. So I know it, it looks a little weird, but FICA is Social Security um, and Medicare. Um, medical insurance, if medical is paid, um, through your paycheck, um, then you'll be able to see that there as well. Um, union dues, if you're part of a union, you know, you're a nurse, um, you're a cop, you're, those union dues are going to show up on your pay stub. So it's really best to keep, keep your most recent pay stub handy and you'll be able to fill out these forms much quicker. Any other deductions that might be on there, uh, let's say that you are repaying a loan, um, that might come out of your pay stub automatically. Let's say that you are contributing to a retirement account, that might be on your pay stub, that, you are, that you're actively contributing to a retirement uh, 401k through your employer, that's gonna automatically come out of your pay stub too. So that, those are some examples. Um, oh, also one other thing, under uh, other, other specified, it's child support. So for example, if you have a child support um, obligation through the Department of Revenue, more than likely that Department of Revenue um, child support number is being taken directly from your pay stub. You'll want to be able to, to write that down too so the judge knows that you have a DOR um, assignment for child support. It's taken right out from your pay stub. Um, that's very helpful. So at the end, um, you'll be able to see that after you'll have your gross income on the top, minus all of the deductions that come out of that pay stub, then you'll be able to see your net weekly income, which for a lot of people is, is significantly less um, than the gross. Then you go to your weekly expenses. And this is also very important because the judge wants to see what your lifestyle is. Um, so you see here rent or mortgage. Again, if you have a monthly rent or a monthly mortgage payment, you'll wanna take that number, multiply it by 12 and divide by 52. That is the best way to find the most accurate uh, weekly expense number for that expense. The other one, same thing, homeowners or tenant insurance. Sometimes that actually is part of your mortgage or your rent, um, but you should double check. 
um, maintenance and repair. This is, you know, if the stove breaks, that might have been $600. You want to make sure that you incorporate that into here. Um, heat, electric, and gas. Telephone, if you have a landline, include that. If you have a cell phone plan, include that as well. Water and sewer, food. Um, you know, I, I find that that's probably one of the higher, the higher expenditures for a lot of people is food. House supplies, you know, if you go to CVS, Target, that kind of thing, make sure that you're, um, you're putting that down. Laundry and cleaning, same thing. CVS, Target, you know, if you have, um, you know, if you have a maid, someone that comes in and helps clean, put that down too. Uh, clothing, you know, um, if you, if you are, you know, going, going to Target and buying kids, kids clothes and your clothes, you want to put all that down. Um, you know, the best way to calculate some of that is just figure out kind of on a monthly basis, how often are you doing that? Are you going to Target once a month and spending, you know, 200 bucks? Okay, fine. You know, so it's, it's better to just kind of take a look on a monthly basis, what you've been doing. And again, multiply that number by 12 divide by 52. Uh, life insurance. This is for private life insurance. If you pay into like Northwestern Mutual, um, you know, for a private life insurance policy, you're going to put that there. Medical insurance. The medical insurance on this side of the form, the weekly expenses, this is um, separate if it's not coming out of your paycheck. So you don't ever want to double dip. Um, uninsured medicals. That's a good one. Uninsured medicals are um, what you pay out of pocket. It could be co-pays whenever you see a doctor. It could be a prescription. Um, and you should include it for both you and the children so the judge knows how much things are costing. You know, sometimes the, the EpiPens or the, um, you know, the medication is expensive um, out of pocket, and we want to know how much that is. Um, motor vehicle expenses and payment. Motor vehicle expenses include gas, um, and also any kind of maintenance issues, um, regular, you know, oil change, stuff like that. The motor vehicle payment, um, that's for if you have a car loan um, or, or a lease. Um, you'll want to write that, that, um, that weekly amount there too. Um, child care. This is if you're, you know, you send your little kid to, um, to, to after school programs or if you send them to all day uh, program, you want to write down that weekly amount. And then there's other which is kind of everything under the sun. Um, but if you know that you have, especially a bigger expense that you traditionally always have, you wanna make sure that you, um, you notify the judge of that as well. All right, almost done, you're hanging in there with me. Um, also, there's a section for counsel fees. So if you do have a lawyer, you can put down how much you've paid the lawyer so far. The judge always wants to know that as well. Um, next one is assets. So if you have a home, you're gonna list the address, um, how the title's held. Do you own it jointly um, as husband and wife? Um, do you own it just by yourself? Um, what the fair market value is. Sometimes the fair market value is, you know, how much is this property worth right now? And one way to figure that out is to Zillow um, your house to see what it says, that's kind of a default. If you recently obtained um, an appraisal on the property for some reason, you should use that number. Um, if you, um, if the bank recently did an appraisal or even if the town did a tax appraisal for it for that year, you can put that number down too. Um, minus the mortgage. So you have the fair market value minus the mortgage. So if you can have your most recent mortgage statement and show the balance um, that's listed on the mortgage, that gives you the equity. So you have your, Fair market value of the house minus mortgage equals how much equity you have in the property. How much is how much equity is there? How much cash do you have left? Um, same thing with the vehicles. Uh, there's a there's a section for vehicles. Um, any kind of retirement account you want to put on there. Any kind of checking account you want to put on there. And again, no need for the entire. Um, no need for the entire number, just the last four digits will do. You have to tell them um, what bank it's at, um, the last four digits, and whether it's a checking, savings, money market, uh, retirement account. Um, and that, that'll be sufficient disclosure. And generally, if you can do the balances um, as close to filling out the form as possible, that's really good. Um, let's see what else. And then we have liabilities. And again, liabilities include you know, we've already discussed the mortgage. So if you have your mortgage um, 
as part of the home part, you don't have to put them again. But liabilities could include student loans, um, private loans, private business loans, um, credit cards. If you have any credit cards that have outstanding debts on them, um, there'll be an opportunity for you to put in how much the total balance is owed on the credit card and how much you you pay off per week. Again, when you're looking at your credit card statement, look at the monthly amount that you've been paying, multiply that number by 12, divide by 52. That'll give you the best number as to what you've been paying down per week um, on a credit card. Um, but certainly the judge wants to know about your liabilities. Um, and at the end, there's gonna be a signature part. So you will date, you will date it and sign it um, and this is a certification that you have told the truth on this financial statement to the best of your ability, that you have researched everything, that you have looked up these, this information yourself, um, and that this is all true, and that the judge can rely on it and the other side can rely on it. Um, let's see. Oh, one other thing I forgot to tell you. So we talked about um, assets. Certainly you can use Zillow or Realtor.com to look up the value of your house. Um, you can use Kelly Blue Book to look up the value of your car. Um, if, if you do not have, they're really big sticklers on this, if you do not have something it, that you have to fill out for a column, so let's say you don't have any retirement accounts, you can put zeros. You have to put zeros. The court doesn't like things to be blank because then they think, oh, you missed it. Put zeros for all of those lines if they do not apply to you. And that way the court knows that you affirmatively are saying, I don't have anything in, uh, that applies in this category, it's zero. Um, one other thing for liabilities that I forgot to mention, if you have any overdue taxes or if you have overdue child support from the Department of Revenue, um, that is also uh, a liability that you wanna, that you wanna include. Um, or any overpayments that are required by the VA. Again, you wanna make sure that you put those down on the little liability um, page. Um, I think that's all that I have for you, but like I said, the, the registries are extremely helpful. Um, they've gone virtual, so you can go on Zoom and talk to someone, they're very nice. Um, I know that Lawyer for the Day program is starting up again virtually for right now, so you can try to sign up for that. And obviously, um, the lawyers at uh, Volunteer Legal, Veteran Legal Services are excellent, and you should feel free to reach out to them, um, and to me, if you have anything uh, that you need to ask. So. Thank you so much. I hope this video was um, informational and that, um, that this is very helpful to you and very best of luck for all of you who are filing. Um, you can do this and you'll make it through. All right, thank you.